morning, ladies and gentlemen, your honor, counselors. Uh, my name is Jason Lewis, and I know that we were introduced briefly yesterday during the jury selection process. I wanted to introduce myself again. Uh, my co-counsel is Carrie Morrissey, who most of you spoke to uh, at least in some, uh, to, to some degree yesterday. Also at council table is Shad Bo. He is our IT specialist and Corporal Alexander Hancock. Uh, she is what's called our case agent and she is a witness who you will be hearing from uh, later, maybe, maybe later today, if not certainly by tomorrow. Um, as the judge mentioned earlier, it is Ms. Morrissey's and mine responsibility to prove to your all satisfaction that Ms. Gutierrez committed the two crimes with which she's been charged uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, the two crimes she's been charged with are involuntary manslaughter and tampering with evidence. Um, this morning I hope to give you a road map of what we intend to introduce uh, throughout the trial and although the statements that I'm making this morning aren't evidence and you can't consider what I'm saying for purposes of your deliberations uh, I just I hope to give you a preview of what the evidence is about uh, what witnesses you're going to be hearing from uh, and again kind of highlight some of the key pieces of evidence that we think we're going to be showing you uh, throughout the trial but most importantly uh, what we want to do is give you the information that you need to answer two key, two key questions. Um, the first being, what are the events that happened on the set of rust that led to the death of Helena Hutchins? And the second question is, uh, how did live ammunition end up on the set of the movie? As to both questions, we believe uh, that it was the negligent acts and failures of the defendant, Ms. Gutierrez, that resulted uh, in both the acts that contributed to Ms. Hutchins' death and to the live rounds being uh, brought onto the set. Uh, a bit later on, I'm going to uh, explain to you exactly how we believe that happened. Um, give me just a minute. I'm going to put some images up on the screen for you guys, but there's a little process we have to go through to get that going. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Helena Hutchins. Um, this is the victim in the case that we're here to deal with this morning. Uh, Ms. Hutchins was born in Ukraine on April 9th, 1979. She was married, her husband's name is Matthew, and she has one son who was nine years old uh, at the time of her death. As a child, Ms. Hutchins lived uh, on a Russian military base loaded, located in the Arctic um, she took an early and keen interest in film and journalism. Uh, she studied both economics and journalism at the Kiev National University, uh, where she received a degree in international journalism. Miss Hutchins met her husband, Matthew, uh, when she was working in the United States in Los, An in Los Angeles, California. Uh, they hit it off so well that they eventually got married. Uh, and when Ms. Hutchins moved and immigrated into the United States, uh, she continued her education and she eventually earned a master's degree in 2015 from the American Film Institute Conservatory. While in Los Angeles, Ms. Hutchins transitioned into the film and television industry working as a cinematographer. Um, this was a job that she loved and she had a great passion for. Um, for those of you, oh, I'm sorry. Just speak up. Okay, I apologize. My microphone has been off this whole time, and I didn't know. Um, 
for those of you who may not know, a cinematographer uh, is a person who works behind the scenes on a film, and uh, the cinematographer is responsible for creating the overall vision of the film. Uh, in very basic terms, the, cin the cinematographer decides how the movie will be lit and colored and how the final footage will appear on the screen when you watch the movie. Uh, and in fact, Miss Hutchins was working as a cinematographer for the movie Rust, uh, which when she was tragically shot and killed on October 21st, 2021. Um, by all accounts, from the folks who knew her and worked with her, and many of those you will be hearing from, um, she was a gifted and talented artist, uh, but above all, she was a loving wife and mother. And like Miss Hutchins, uh, the defendant, Hannah Gutierrez, was also a behind-the-scenes member of the Rust crew. Um, Ms. Gutierrez was hired to perform a dual role on the movie. Um, she was hired to be both an armorer and a props assistant. As a props assistant, uh, it was Ms. Gutierrez's primary duty to essentially go out and source and bring back to the film set everything that the actors need to touch as part of making the movie. So for example, if they're doing a kitchen scene, then Ms. Gutierrez would have gone out, purchased plates, cups, glasses, forks, all of that sort of stuff, and then those would have been incorporated into the set. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Gutierrez's other role was as the movie's armorer, and it's that role that really has brought us here today. The armorer has a few key responsibilities. Um, the first responsibility is to source and bring to the set all of the firearms that are going to be used as part of the movie. <clears throat> so for a modern movie, that may, it re that may have required her to purchase mach or uh, obtain machine guns, semi-automatic semi handguns, uh, long rifles, and that sort of thing. But for a Western like Rust, uh, the armorer would have to source weapons that were in use at the time so that the movie looks more authentic. And so that would include finding old looking revolvers uh, and shotguns uh, and, and things of that nature. I've just put up a photo. This is the firearm that Mr. Baldwin was using in this movie. Um, this is also the firearm that was uh, used in the incident that resulted in the death of uh, Ms. Hutchins. One of the things that I think is important for you all to understand is that throughout this trial, we all may refer to these type of firearms as prop guns, but make no mistake, they are legitimate firearms. If you put a bullet, a live bullet, inside of these guns, they will fire. So we sometimes refer to them as prop weapons, um, but they are absolutely capable of causing a projectile to fly out of the barrel. Um, the other thing uh, that it's important for you all to know is that although the, this particular weapon looks old, uh, it is actually a brand new gun. Uh, this gun was purchased directly from the manufacturer for, this, for the purpose of being used in this movie. And although it looks old, uh, it has, it's not a gun that has had hundreds or thousands of rounds put through it. It was a brand new and perfectly functioning gun when it arrived on the set. Uh, the second thing that the armorer is responsible for is sourcing and purchasing blank and dummy ammunition. You're gonna be hearing a lot throughout this trial about the differences between live ammunition, blank ammunition, dummy ammunition. So I'm just gonna kinda of give you a 10,000 foot overview of, of what this stuff is. The image that's on your screen right now is what's called a blank round. A blank round is actually pretty easy to distinguish because it has that crimped end where, a, where normally a bullet would be. Uh, the reason that blanks are used in the movie 
is because when it's in the gun and an actor pulls a trigger, uh, there is enough gunpowder inside of that blink to cause a pop and have a, a cloud of smoke come out from the gun, but it doesn't have a projectile that shoots through the barrel of the gun. So these are a type of uh, round that is used frequently on the movie sets, especially whenever they want to make, uh, make it look like the actor is actually firing a weapon. The second type of round that is used on the sets are what's called dummy rounds. And these are a little bit, these are a different story. Dummies look exactly like real bullets. As you can tell from kind of that main image there, although this uh, evidence dummy round has some writing on it, you wouldn't be able to distinguish that from a live bullet if you were just looking at it with your eyes. Uh, and because these dummy rounds are designed to look exactly like live ammunition, <clears throat> every round has to be thoroughly checked before it is put inside of one of these firearms. Um, aside from sourcing firearms, blanks, and dummies for the movie, uh, the next major function that Hannah was required to do on the movie set is that she was required to check every single one of these rounds uh, to make sure that it's a, the appropriate blank or dummy and not live ammunition before it gets inserted into the gun. And there are two primary ways uh, that an armorer or anybody who's familiar with this can check to make sure that a, a round is a dummy round. The first thing they can do is shake it. And if you'll see in that, uh, on the lower right hand side, we, I've got a photograph for you there of a plastic container that's got three BBs in it. Um, those BBs are inside of that dummy round so that whenever you shake it, you can audibly hear that it's making a noise and that way you know it's a dummy round. Sometimes they have a little spring in there rather than these bullets, but they always have some sort of noise maker in there. Uh, the other way to distinguish a dummy from a real live bullet is in that top right photograph and you'll see that that, uh, that cartridge has a hole drilled into the side of the casing. That's the second way that you can distinguish a dummy round from a live round. And then we have, not to overcomplicate things, but I think it's important that you know this, we also have some dummy rounds that are missing what's called the primer. Uh, normally on a, on a live cartridge, there's a, an, ex, uh, an explosive element that is inside of that center portion that whenever the hammer of the gun hits that primer, it causes a small spark that then ignites the rest of the gunpowder in the bullet and causes the, uh, the projectile to be expelled. So dummy rounds, as you can, as you can see, uh, they do look an awful lot like live ammunition, but there are ways, if you are careful, that you can distinguish a, uh, a dummy round from a live round. The next major function is the, of the armorer is to check the firearm before it is brought on to the set. Um, and there's a very specific process that is used for this. Uh, when it's time for a firearm to be used, the armorer is required to present the firearm to the first assistant director to double check that only dummy rounds uh, are inside the gun. And the armorer is also supposed to offer the actor who is receiving the gun the opportunity to also have the gun inspected in front of them. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in this case, uh, Ms. Gutierrez did not always adhere to these uh, safety procedures and you're going to hear from several witnesses who will testify that she often rushed through this critical step uh, and skipped and sometimes she skipped this check altogether. So <clears throat> let's turn to what happened on October 21st, 2021. The cast and crew of the Rust film 
we're out at the Bonanza Creek Ranch, which is a, uh, a ranch located just outside the city limits of Santa Fe. Um, it's several, several thousand acres large, and it has an Old West style uh, town that's built there, and uh, often movies are filmed there. And I've got an example, an example photo here, just to kind of give you an idea of what the set looks like. Um, it's nothing particularly fancy. It's just an old west looking town. Uh, part, part of the set, and this is located a little bit away from the town itself, is this church. And it was at this church that the incident resulting in Miss Hutchins' death occurred. Um, the evidence is going to show that on October 21st, it was a fairly chaotic day on the set of the movie. Um, the evening before, a group of camera operators who had some concerns about various safety issues on set sent an email to the production team uh, indicating that they were going to be quitting. And so the next day, in response to this notice, uh, the producers decided to push ahead with filming anyway, and they decided to use less camera equipment than what was normally used, and they tried to just improvise and make do with what they had. Filming on the morning of the 21st was largely uneventful. The cast and crew filmed several scenes without any particular incidents occurring. Um, Leading up to the lunch hour, a small group of cast and crew were inside uh, the church working on getting some close-up shots of Alec Baldwin sitting on a church pew uh, and manipulating his uh, revolver. That scene was completed just before lunch, and so they called for a lunch break. Uh, and let me back up just a little bit. Uh, before the lunch break was called, I, I want you all to see what was going on. Uh, this is a... So that gives you an idea of what was going on that morning. Uh, Alec Baldwin was sitting on a church pew and he was practicing this draw from his holster. Uh, with the camera crew kind of close up on top of him. So they completed that scene and they called for uh, the lunch hour to occur. Um, so during the lunch hour, Ms. Gutierrez took the gun from Mr. Baldwin and she uh, took it back to the, to the safe, the gun safe, that was loaded on a prop cart. Um, once lunch was over, the production decided that they wanted to continue working inside of the church. Um, but at this point, they weren't actually filming anything like they were in this video that I just showed you. And instead, they were doing what's called a blocking. And that is, in film terms, what you do before you even get to a rehearsal. So it's like a very rough rehearsal where the lighting director, the camera operator, and all of the folks are trying to get things situated so that they can then move into a rehearsal. Whenever a blocking is going on because they aren't filming, I, there's really no need for the actor to have a live uh, firearm in their hands or even for the live firearm to yet be, be on set. Um, you're going to hear from several witnesses, or from one witness in particular, uh, who's going to testify that for purposes of blocking, uh, Mr. Baldwin could have been using a stick, a rubber gun, uh, anything that would essentially allow him to mimic a gun. It didn't have to be a live firearm. Um, on that day, though, the defendant was asked to provide Mr. Baldwin with a live firearm for the blocking. Uh, and she did, and, and that was within her discretion to do so. Um, you're going to hear that on the day, loaded the gun in the morning with five rounds. Uh, the revolver, though, is a six-shooter, 
so it can hold six rounds, but in that morning, she only was able to load five of them. Uh, after the lunch break was over, uh, Ms. Gutierrez retrieved the gun from the safe and she cleaned that sixth hole and was able to put a sixth round into the sixth slot. Ms. Gutierrez then took the firearm to the church and handed the gun over to the first assistant director whose name is Dave Halls. Ms. Gutierrez and Mr. Halls then did a sloppy and incomplete safety check of the gun where the dummy rounds were removed from the gun and rattled or checked to see if they had a hole drilled in it. Instead, she just kind of cracked open the gun and partially sp spun the cylinder to show Mr. Halls a few of the rounds, but they were not removed from the gun and they weren't all checked. After the incident happened, and when Ms. Gutierrez was being interviewed by, by the investigating officers, uh, she stated that when she removed the gun from the safe to begin the filming uh, for the afternoon session, she didn't recheck the ammunition. So when she pulled the gun out and put the sixth bullet in, she didn't independently check the rounds at that time either. Our witnesses are gonna testify uh, that when the defendant pulled the gun out of the safe after, the, after lunch, what she should have done was open the gun and independently herself checked each and every round. Then when she took it to the church and handed it to Mr. Halls, she should have done a second complete ammo check with Mr. Halls because this double redundancy is what helps prevent the kind of incidents that occurred to Miss Hutchins from happening. This means she should have opened the gun, removed each cartridge, confirmed that they were dummy rounds by individually shaking them, rattling them, or seeing the board hole. Uh, and because, the, because these dummy rounds are so similar to live rounds, her decision to just crack it open and spin the cylinder a little bit to look at the head stamps wasn't enough. She needed to do a complete check. So having failed to do that check herself, she then handed the firearm to Mr. Halls anyway. She exited the church and then Mr. Halls handed the firearm to Mr. Baldwin. As the blocking session was underway, Mr. Hutchins and uh, excuse me, Ms. Hutchins and several of her crewmates were busily working, looking through and adjusting cameras. Uh, and Mr. Baldwin was sitting on that church pew uh, practicing how he would hold the gun for the upcoming filming session. Um, as Mr. Baldwin was manipulating the firearm, uh, it, he caused it to discharge and that unfortunately sent a projectile uh, flying directly at Ms. Ms. Hutchins. Uh, the projectile shot completely through Ms. Hutchins and then struck the film's director, Joel Souza, in the shoulder. So at this point, the set paramedic was called into the church and began life-saving efforts on both Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza. Another crew member who was in the church called 911 to report the shooting and to seek additional medical assistance. But because of the ranch's remote location, it took some time before additional medical per personnel arrived. Um, and, and this additional support also included a, a life flight helicopter for Ms. Hutchins. Um, a team of medical personnel worked to stabilize her uh, and they placed her on the life flight to UNMH um, but sadly, the personnel at UNMH were unable to overcome the injuries that she sustained uh, and she was pronounced deceased at UNMH. We will show you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but that by failing to make those vital safety checks, uh, the defendant acted, neg acted negligently and without due caution 
and that the decisions she made that day ultimately contributed to Miss Hutchins' death. So that's what happened on the 21st. But now I want to talk to you a little bit about what happened leading up to the 21st. There are some other ways that Miss Hutchins, or excuse me, that Miss Gutierrez was negligent on the set. We intend to call several witnesses to give testimony that she regularly failed to properly carry out her duties as an armorer. Uh, these witnesses are going to describe the defendant's conduct as unprofessional and sloppy. You will hear testimony that she routinely left guns and ammunition lying and that her gun safe and ammo cart were constantly disorganized. The second question that we want to answer for you is where these live bullets came from. The prospect of live ammunition landing up on a film set is incomprehensible. It's something that should never happen. Uh, it's a hard and fast industry rule that live ammunition should be miles away from a film set at all times because of the risk that it poses for being confused with the dummy rounds that are used on the set. I'm showing you a picture now of a box of ammunition uh, that Ms. Gutierrez says she was pulling cartridges from uh, to Mr. Baldwin's fire, uh, firearm on the day the fatal shooting occurred. Um, if you can see the arrow that I'm kind of wiggling around here, this is the box of ammunition that she was pulling from. This is a box of dummies. The second box here is a box of blanks. So these are the kind of rounds that will pop and create smoke. These are the type of rounds that are just supposed to be completely inert. When the officers arrived on the set uh, after the shooting, this cart is where those two box of, boxes of ammunition were first found. Um, when the officer who uh, was in charge of this prop cart uh, uncovered that the boxes on there were, were the ones that were being used for that day's filming and placed them into his police unit. And that's what you saw in those previous slides. Uh, these are the boxes of ammunition inside of a cop car. Eventually, uh, these, the, the box of dummies was uh, taken back to the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office where it was inventoried and photographed by a crime scene, a crime scene technician whose name is Marissa Popple, and she's going to be a witness in this case. Um, the first box of dummies that was opened up is what is on your monitors right now. Uh, this is a styrofoam container that has approximately 37 cartridges in, in it. Uh, according to the label on the outside of the box, uh, these are supposed to be dummy cartridges. And I don't know if you've noticed yet, but there is one of these cartridges that doesn't look like the others. It's that one with the red square. Uh, you can see that it has a silver primer, whereas all of the other ones have brass primers. The cartridge in that red box is a live bullet. So this was another live bullet that was found on the set, not just the one that was in Mr. Baldwin's firearm. Ultimately, you're going to hear from us that there were not just these two, but a total of six live bullets that were found on the set. Six. You're also going to hear that all six of those live rounds have the same, uh, have common characteristics of having this silver or nickel covered primer, a shiny brass casing, and what's called a Starline brass head stamp. I don't know if you can tell in your monitors or not, but this, the, this impression that is on each of these cartridges 
it looks like a star and then a line and a star. Uh, that, that indicates that it's a Starline brass manufactured casing. So we knew from the evidence gathered on October 21st, uh, and when we had these rounds uh, examined by the FBI, uh, we discovered that there were actually those six live rounds on set. And so our next step was to determine whether there was any way, if we could tell when those live rounds ended up on the set. Um, so we began to comb through all of the photos and videos that had been recorded on the set from the very first day the filming began. And we started to notice something. We were able to identify several points in time where the cartridges with a silver primer and a, and a shiny brass cartridge ended up being spotted inside of the gun belts and bandoliers that the cast members were wearing on the set. Uh, in fact, we found a photograph where there was one occasion where a live round was sitting right on Miss Gutierrez's lap and she failed to identify it. What you're looking now, <clears throat> what you're looking at now is a photograph of Miss Gutierrez and on her lap, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that styrofoam uh, casing holder. I'm going to show you a, a call-out that's been in And you can see, I hope you can see on your monitors, that these bullets here, kind of on the top right, appear to have a brass casing but these other, at least these other two bullets, most definitely uh, this cartridge that's in the blue circle, you can see that there is a silver primer um, on, that, uh, on that cartridge. And we believe uh, that that was a live bullet sitting on her lap and she failed to identify it. It's important that you know that this photograph was taken on October 10th. And the reason it's important for you to, to make note that this photograph was taken on October 10th is because the other dummy round purchased for this movie didn't even arrive to the set until October 12th. So this means that the, the live ammunition could not have been from the shipment that came in on October 12th uh, and that belonged or that was supplied by somebody other than uh, Ms. Gutierrez. This also will help you uh, when you hear from the defendant's counsel who are likely going to suggest to you that there was some kind of uh, sabotage on uh, a foot on the set or that the live rounds came from someone other than Ms. Uh, Ms. Gutierrez. This photograph, we think, uh, will help you conclude uh, that the live rounds were on set on the 10th and that the other bullet, the other uh, dummy rounds were the 12th. We also have a little bit more evidence that these live rounds came onto the set via the defendant when she came to New Mexico from out of state. Um, as you can see from this photo, this is the box of rounds. This is kind of a blown up photograph of the box of rounds that she was pulling from on the day of the shooting. And you can see that it has a very specific label on it. It says 45 long colt dummies. And then in much smaller print there in the middle, you can see the initials JS. So on November 9th, uh, a couple of weeks after the shooting, the defendant came into the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office uh, for an interview with Corporal Hancock, and she was asked questions about the box of ammunition she was pulling from the day of the uh, incident, this box with the small JS on the label. Uh, the defendant told Corporal Hancock that, the, that she thought this box was kind of peculiar and she wasn't certain where it came from, 
but she said that she didn't believe it was one of the uh, boxes that was originally brought on set. But then the defendant offered to Corporal Hancock that the day prior to the interview, she had asked her father back home uh, to text her a photograph of the box of 45 long colt dummies that they had at his home. And she texted him, uh, and he texted her this photo in response. It's identical. It's the same box. The box of dummies she was pulling from on the 21st is identical to the box of dummies that her father had at home. So we believe this is more evidence that this box of dummies with the live round in it came from the defendant. We're also going to show you how these live rounds slowly spread their way throughout the set, eventually landing in several of the actors' costumes and firearms on October 13th, 15th, 17th, and of course on the 21st. And the image on your screen now, you can see uh, in the, the large photograph that's the bandolier that Mr. Baldwin was wearing on the 21st. There is a live round inside of that bandolier. The black belt that's in the lower right hand corner is a belt that was worn by another cast member. There's a live round in that belt too. The evidence you're going to hear throughout this trial is that the defendant was unprofessional and that she failed to do the essential safety functions of her job and that these failures resulted in live ammunition being spread throughout this entire set. Once the live ammunition was on the set, she failed to detect it because she didn't follow those essential safety protocols that required her to inspect every round before they were placed into the gun. The evidence will show that the defendant treated the safety protocols as if they were optional rather than if people's lives counted on her doing her job correctly. Uh, we will show you that as a direct result of her failures, uh, Ms. Gutierrez call caused Ms. Hutchins' death. The last, or I should say the second crime <clears throat> that Ms. Her Ms. Gutierrez has been charged with is tampering with evidence. The evidence with regard to this charge is a lot more simple, a lot simpler. Um, you're gonna hear testimony that on the day that Ms. Hutchins was killed and after the defendant left her interview at the sheriff's office, she went back to her, her she went back to her hotel. Um, knowing that the defendant had probably been through a lot that day, one of her crewmates went to her room to check on her to see how she was doing. Um, and after they were done visiting, uh, the crew member, got, crew member got up to leave, and as she was walking out of the room, the defendant, the defendant handed her something and asked her to hang on to it for her. At first, this crew member didn't really realize what she had been handed, so she walked out of the room, started down the hallway, and when she looked into her hand, she realized she had been handed a baggie of suspected cocaine from the defendant. Uh, she will testify that she was surprised that the defendant, who was somebody she hardly knew, would hand her a bag of suspected cocaine to hang on to, hang on to for her. Uh, the crew member is gonna testify that she disposed of the cocaine. She didn't wanna be caught with it, so she just threw it away. Um, and you're gonna hear that the defendant over the next several weeks texted this crew member several times asking her to return her stuff, which the uh, crew member is gonna testify is in reference to the baggie of cocaine. I know I've gone through a lot of uh, information with you guys and, and I hope you're not too overwhelmed, uh, but that's why we're gonna spend the next couple of weeks with you going over all of this evidence in a lot more detail. Uh, you're gonna hear from a multitude of law enforcement officers. You're gonna hear from firearms experts. 
You're going to hear from four FBI analysts covering the topics of fingerprints, DNA, explosives comparisons, and firearms testing. You're going to hear from an image enhancement uh, expert. And most importantly, you're going to hear from witnesses who worked with Ms. Gutierrez every day on the movie set, uh, including the film's director and several of the crew members who were inside the church on the day of this horrific incident. We're confident that after you hear from these witnesses and after you have an opportunity to look at the evidence for yourself in greater detail, you will agree with us that the defendant's actions were not only negligent on October 21st, but on many days leading up to the 21st. Uh, we hope that after you review this information, uh, you will find her guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And after reviewing and hearing from the witness concerning the tampering charge, uh, we believe that you will also uh, convict her on the tampering with evidence charge as well. I'm about done, but I do want to leave you with one final statement, and this is a statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting. She says at the end, I just, I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And so do we. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, before we t take yours, I think we'll take a bathroom break, okay? So please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. Um, so go ahead, George, stand. All rise. <laughs>